Let me make a few comments about this uh, again, just to hopefully strengthen the idea of um, what the linear regression is. Um, 1D plot, let's look at the, uh, whichever, the no sensor one is fine. So here's, here's our regression matrix again. Here's the model fit to the data. At, at our current voxel, uh, remember what 3 d Convolve does is you've, you've basically told 3 d Convolve this is, this is my regression matrix. So now it's 3 d Convolve's job or whatever who's, whatever is doing the linear regression to fit this to the black data, the black time series at this voxel location. And it solves, it tries to add up some, add up some uh, multiplier on each of these time series and add them together so that the fit is as close to the black curve as possible. And as close as possible is defined to be so, such that the residual time series has the minimal sum of squares, right? That's, that's the purpose of the regression. So it might have a beta weight of 90, 99.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.002, what negative 0 0.019, whatever, these num beta weights on each one of these, and then beta weights on each one of these we can actually look at. So at this voxel, let's look at the beta weights for some of those uh, other regress regresses just briefly. We're at, I mean, this, this time series is for this voxel, right? So let's just look briefly um, I'll set my overlay to the visual to be the visual reliable coefficient. Uh, it happens to be almost exactly two. The beta weight is two. So, so three D Deconvolve's solution for this fit model had a multiplier of two times this yellow or gold curve added into the fit. So two of this come out here. And does that make sense? Well, if we go to the, uh, to the time series window here, if I just click somewhere, it's going to follow the black curve. But So my red dot is here. The value is 98.23. What should the value up there be? Probably just over 100. 100.11. So this height is basically a height of 2. And this height is the beta weight at this voxel. It's the, height of, it's the height of the gold curve applied in the fit. And you notice we're on the third bump here. The, that third bump is from the visual reliable task. These first two bumps are from the auditory reliable. If we go to a different location in space, let me just do, do this myself briefly. If I set my overlay to be the V minus A GLTT stat, and now I have to lower the threshold, 27 is pretty strict for that. I'm going to just very quickly clusterize this. Cluster, set, report, jump. Oh, that, that voxel kind of sucks, that kind of sucks. A lot of garbage in here. So these are showing big differences, but they're not too exciting. Let me be, ugh. Trying to be a little, a little more picky about the threshold, but I shouldn't be using a power of uh, three there. Okay, that's, that's better. So this voxel, where in the world are we now? If only we had a button that said, where am I? But of course, that's not possible. So at this location of the brain, I'll go back to the all runs underlay now that we see where we are. We have this time series here. And you notice uh, these first two bumps are smaller. These are big bumps, that's a little bump. So we can see these are this, 
the, the height of this is basically the beta weight for the visual reliable condition. And the height of this is the beta weight for the audio reliable. And you see they're different. And they fit the data well, so it's significant. So we see a big difference. What in the world is with this blue spike? That doesn't look good. Well, that's around that motion time, right? What happens in, in, in the regression model and actually in the output of 3D Deconvolve from censoring? Well, when you censor a time point, the, the residual by definition is zero. This, at the sen because of censoring, your residual, time, your residual value is set to zero. But therefore, the fit value is actually equal to the data value. So your fit will be on top of the data value uh, at any time point that you've censored. So that, that may look a little odd here, but that's, that's why you get this, the sensor spike in there. I think that's, that's enough from the GUI. I just wanted to show, uh, do one quick group analysis from this. Does anyone have any last questions about this analysis? You, uh, it, I mean, the first level analysis, single subject analysis, is fully complete here. Uh, any, any last questions? So you, so you did censorship, and here do you include the censored frames? The, the censored time points are included because this, this is all 450 time points. So that, what that means is at any censored time points, the residuals will be zero and the fit will exactly match the data. So the, the blue is actually on top of the black here, though you can't see them. Okay, so now we've done our single subject analysis. Let's, let's uh, do a quick, quick yet arduous journey uh, of a group analysis. So you can, you can just watch. Uh, nothing too exciting here. But I'll, I'll try to go quick, quickly. So I'm going to CD up two directories back into the uh, AFNI data 6 directory. And then I'll go into this group results directory here. And uh, you want a covariate or just a paired test? How about just a paired test? So we've got this uh, script five is a paired t-test. In, in order to do a group analysis in AFDI, you don't necessarily have to move any of your stats data sets around. You can just leave them wh where they are. You can in include volume index selectors or volume label selectors in your t-test command. So you can say, I want the uh, v VREL, the visual reliable underscore COIF data, data volume. So you can request it by name in, in, the, in the command. Oh, I'll, so I'll get back to that. So, but that's not what we did here. We just threw a directory together that had ordinarily squared betas, the two betas uh, for our, our set of 10 subjects. And then we had REML using 3D REML fit in the ARMA 1.1 model for temporal autocorrelation in the noise. So we have REML results for our subjects too. So you can trivially play with these things. But those are just, uh, just to show you 3D info on one of these files. It's just the two volumes with the VREL and AREL coefficient. So it's just the beta weights were extracted with 3D bucket and thrown here. And of course, you can see the 3D bucket command at the end of 3D info. So, so let's run a quick t-test. This t-test was generated with gen group command. If you just want to do a t-test or 3D ANOVA or, or MIMO or something like that, and you have 80 data sets, you don't want to type in a command that has 80 data sets. You know, typos and, and it's just a lot of work. You basic the purpose of 3D of gen group command is to give D sets dash D sets with a wild card to specify all your data sets. And it will expand this and it will include sub brick selectors so that you don't have to type that out 80 times. And the, the, the result of that is 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 something that looks just like this. So let's run a group T test. Again, that's an, a long journey, TCSH. How do you spell TCSH? Done. So uh, now it's computed everything. 
and we can look at that overlay stat S5 t test. Uh, that's the contrast and the, the actual, say, beta weight of it. Where am I going? Let's threshold this at, uh, that's fantastic, about 3.01. 3 Perfect. And I'll scale this to a magnitude of 1. So this is a paired t-test. At every voxel, we have uh, 10 subjects that have audio reliable beta weights and visual reliable beta weights beta weights. So what the paired t-test for that compares the average of the 10 audio reliable values, 10, just 10. It's 10 subjects, not many. Not 450 time points, it's 10 subjects now. Uh, those 10 values against the visual reliable 10 values and takes the V minus A contrast and, and the stats here, but that's, and that's what you're seeing. I'll just very briefly clusterize this again just so we can see some clusters and lo and behold we have some clusters in the visual area and some clusters in the auditory area. Fantastic. So the, the group test, uh, of course, you'll be more picky about doing this well, but that's, that's more or less all there is, is to it in this case. After this point, you want to, you know, you need to decide based on the, uh, uh, the blur estimates of the data, you'll, you'll probably pick some cluster size that defines significance. So, uh, presumably 176 voxels would be fine. So this actually gives a very clear group result even with only 10 subjects. But you know, normally you don't have those huge bold responses with such you know, clear beta weights, yeah, so such clear results. But here, 10 subjects, piece of cake. And the, uh, the uh, distortions across subjects are not great. So even, even with that in, involved, we get, we get a result. <coughs> Just as a reminder, when I when I plot when I showed the pictures, the images for this, I used the contrast T stat for my threshold because I want to I, I'm I want to show in my paper voxels where the contrast between V and A is significant. So I set uh, my uncorrected P value to P of 0 0.0147. Oh, that's not <coughs> not very great. Let's let's be more picky than that. Can we go up to a zero or down to zero zero one to appease any cra crazy statisticians in the room like Gong? So a little tighter now. Anyway, so uh, uncorrected p of point zero zero one, and you decide on what cluster size you need for a significance at point oh five or whatever, and then you you get your results. Any questions about this? We'll, we'll babble more about that stuff uh, later, but here's an example just uh, doing it here. Okay, so uh, after this time, uh, you'll, you have basically three choices. You can run away screaming or not screaming. I don't know if that's two extra choices. Or you can, uh, we have, uh, assignments you can work on just to help you practice with running AFNI commands by yourself or you know wh with with your friends or whomever but typing in the AFNI commands thinking about so these are basically questions imagine questions your colleagues might ask you how do you do this or what does this mean or whatever and you're trying to figure it out so we have a handout set of these questions a separate handout with hints and a separate handout with answers don't mess around, just open them all up. But first read the question, think about it, then read the hint, then think about it, then read the answer. So you actually go through a progression. But uh, that, that's a very helpful way to practice. The other thing you can do is uh, we, will, we will just roam the room chatting with, with people for you know, a couple minutes at a time. And you can, you can also talk to us about your experiments or, or you know, whatever data issues you may have. We'll, we will do this again tomorrow for the last class. One option during this time, too, is you could, if you feel so ambitious, you could bring your own data and at EPI and timing files and try to analyze it. You know, you can do that. 
So uh, you, you can ponder. But anyway, so um, let me just show you the, the slides, the handouts that have the questions and, and whatnot. And then your, your time is your own. So I'll cede you into AFD handouts. And these are called something, something with jazz involved. Ella, Ella's paper, the graph dash line, jazz, jazz. Okay, AFNI 19. Oh, the, the ones that are in green there, okay. Why, I, I, I think green is accidental. They're just, uh, they have execute permissions on them. But the, so these are the handouts. AFNI jazz is just the questions. The hints are the hints, and then the answers are the answers. So we, you can just open them all and uh, ponder them. Of course, you can do them in whatever order you want. But so the, f the first one talks about running 3D bucket. Later on, some of them, uh, one of them talks about uh, understanding the X matrix. Here, chap problem five talks about the X matrix. So you can peek through these and see what's interesting to you or whatnot. Otherwise, uh, chat about your experiments or just run away. Do you want to show them the uh, classified help? Oh sure, sure. Uh, just a just a little help page that uh, uh, Daniel wants to show you. So if I go to AFNI under the documentation, so I w uh, again just just at the main AFNI site we have these tabs up top. The documentation is this Sphinx documentation that we have. And classified program list. I bet that's what you mean. So 2.5 here under educational resources. And what this has is these, uh, these, the, these blue headings are like types of programs. So remember, we babble about having like 600 AFNI programs to keep you occupied with. What program should I use to do this, depending on what your this is? If you want to, say, do registration, um, I don't, that could be anywhere here, too. Do we have a registration section? Correlation, resting state? I don't know. Let's just per pick one, OK? Uh, edit dsets header. So you're, you, you've created your own data sets, but uh, the source of the data was not good, and left and right is incorrect. <coughs> So the data, sh the data claims that this is the left side of the brain, but it's really the right. And you, you want to fix that in the header. So you need something that <coughs> you need to be able to edit DSET headers. We can click on any of those. There's the uh, caption, and then there are a bunch of programs. And some of these programs have big numbers in front of them. Those might be uh, programs we would suggest you to use. There are a lot of programs that are somewhat obsolete or antiquated or uh, otherwise not recommended. So, but we haven't filled this all in perfectly. So, here's a list that can actually get you in the right spot. So, 3D info, 3D refit is the one that really allows you to change an AFNI header. If you have a Nifty data set that you want to fix, Nifty tool would probably be your go to resource. So uh, you may be interested if you're going to use AFNI for an extended period of time. Hopefully, you're not done with AFNI as of this week. Uh, if you use it for an extended period of time, you might want to be informed of updates that are, say, more important than more more than trivial updates. So uh, every week or three, we send out an AFNI digest that is just a little text file of a couple noteworthy items. So just just to keep your up yourself up to date. So if you want to know about that, uh, you could just send us email to that AFNI boot camp thing. And, uh, or do they, they go to a website for that? Do they sign up for that? I don't remember. I don't remember either. So anyway, just contact us and we can, yeah, we can sign you up. It might be, it might be an NIH website where you uh, apply to this, but you can figure that out. <coughs> 